Hey, what's going on, Giants and Jets fans? Welcome to the latest episode of our Talk is Cheap Giants and Jets podcast. Uh, Daryl Slater here with Andy Vasquez from NJ Advanced Media, the Star Ledger, and NJ.com. It is uh, Thursday, June the 20th right now, and obviously hope you guys are staying cool. I guess unless you're listening to this in a part of the country that's not blazing hot, but uh, dealing with this, this heat wave right now, and it's been a little bit more than a week since... The Giants, Jets, and the rest of the NFL wrapped up spring practices with the conclusion of minicamp, and we're about five weeks out from training camp for both the Jets and Giants. They're going to report on the 23rd of July, and uh, the next the next day, obviously, is always the, the first practice. It's always that last Wednesday-ish of, of July. So uh, we're going to just recap the spring here. Obviously, some interesting storylines to discuss. Uh, some that were expected in terms of the Giants quarterback situation and, and Daniel Jones not getting much work. Some that were not expected. Aaron Rodgers deciding to not attend mandatory mini camp and all that has gone with that, um, even though that's kind of died down a little bit. So we'll look back a little bit. We'll look forward a little bit and we will uh, send you all on your way into this little break and reconvene then uh, right around the start of, of training camp. And so, Andy, how you doing? Hanging in there. It's definitely warm, but um yeah i'll take this over shoveling snow so i'm not gonna complain too oh, much absolutely you go out in the shade even you know as we're recording this at uh what 10 30 in the morning it's still pretty nice out there in the shade so um yeah so so we'll start with just broad strokes for the jets and the giant the giants jets or whatever order you want to do it i'll start with giant stuff and then we'll get a little bit deeper into stuff you know don't need to review every exact you know, precise situation with both these teams, but the broad strokes for the giants coming out of the spring, obviously Daniel Jones did not get any team periods reps, not a surprise coming off the torn ACL, not ultimately a big deal. So drew lock got all those reps. He looked fine at times, sloppy at others and kind of is what he is, as we've discussed in terms of his ability to be a starting quarterback at this level. And so um, big training camp coming up for Daniel Jones at the start of a make or break year. Uh, that kind of a this is it last chance year for him. And he says he'll be fine for the start of training camp. And so we'll see how he look. He, and, and look, he did, we did do, he did do some stuff in the spring. We got to see him do stuff. Um, 12 practices the Giants had, five of them were open to reporters between OTAs and mini camp. And, and Jones did seven on seven stuff in mini camp, but not in, or in OTAs rather, but they didn't do any of that in mini camp. But he moved around pretty well, especially later in, in OTAs. Looked like he was moving all right in the pocket and, Obviously, none of this is contact. None of this has pads. So this is kind of like, uh, you know, half football, not even that uh, quarter, you know, a quarter of what real football actually is. And uh, but Jones, I thought, you know, look, look fine. Obviously, the Giants um, throughout the spring had some had some some stuff, but it was kind of quiet. Darius Slayton has had his little mini hold out, but he came back. Um, with really not much of a revised contract, you know, got the incentives put in there. Um, so a, a make or break year for him. And then the questions that the Giants had going into this uh, set of spring practices really very similar to what it was going into the the spring. And 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 the broad questions, of course, um, you know, the offensive line. How is this offensive line going to develop together? Is Evan Neal going to be ready coming off the ankle surgery? Did nothing pretty much in the spring. Um, and so that will be a huge question mark as it has been for how many years now for the giants, the line. Um, and so what do they do if Neil, they can't depend on him right tackle. Does Jermaine Illuminor slide off from left guard? He got all those left guard reps in the spring, nothing at right tackle. I mean, can you trust Josh Azudu at right tackle? So, so many questions on this offensive line again, as usual. And then with the weapons with Darren Waller retiring, not really a huge shock there. The, who are, who are going to be the weapons here with Waller gone, Saquon Barkley gone? That, that's a lot of pressure on Malik Neighbors, who looked really good at times in the spring. Again, it's a spring, but he, you do it, you know, it's not like he can magically have pads on and be playing against the 49ers, for instance, right? So he did what he could in, in the spring, and he did a really nice job from what we saw. Made some really electric catches at times. So we'll see if this what this offense could do in terms of explosive plays with no Barkley, no Waller. Not that Waller was going to be a, you know, all pro this year, but um, they certainly could have used them. So obviously defensively, they're going to be a team that is going to play more zone and blitz less. And can they get home with Brian Burns in the pass rush and Kayvon Thibodeau on a four man leading a four man rush. And obviously some position battles to watch are most notably in the secondary. And then we can, we'll get to that later on, but just kind of teasing that. Um, That's where the giants are. 
obviously the Jets, I know which you're going to start with as your main kind of broad brush storyline. Where do you stand on all things Jets and especially all things Aaron Rodgers at this point? Yeah, I mean, in the big scheme of things, is it a huge deal in, in a vacuum, I guess is the best way to put this. Is it, is it a huge deal that Aaron Rodgers missed minicamp after being there for every OTA practice? No, it's it's not a big deal. The big deal is that Aaron Rodgers looked like Aaron Rodgers. He moved around fine. His arm is still great. Uh and he seemed to build confidence with his body uh, as OTAs went on. That That is kind of the, the biggest story here, but you can't just dismiss this because it's, it's not in a vacuum. And, and with everything Aaron Rodgers said about leadership and everything he's asked of his teammates and, and then going and doing the opposite throughout the entire off season. And the Jets had actually, you know, there was some drama early in the off season, a lot of nonsense, but since the draft, it, it had been all football, yeah, and and it all looked pretty good. And and when you started looking at this roster, you see a team that's you know more qualified than they were last year to to be a playoff team and 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 to potentially make some noise, uh, you know, in December and January. So, so when you think of that, this isn't a huge deal, but it it is because it just doesn't make sense. It, it's a sign that something's off. Like I'm not saying the Jets prioritize storylines or narratives or appearances over winning but that that you know pie chart is is too heavy on the non-winning the the you know the the way things look trying to have their cake and eating it too trying to look like they're being hard on Aaron Rodgers when they're not um all these things you know it, it's a sign that all of this is still in the background there and um I do think it's a big deal in that you know, if it this this didn't feel like a nothing story. It, it got picked up nationally. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's having to ask what, what answer questions about it. And, you know, guys, Salah was clearly annoyed about it on the last day of, of mini camp when it came back up again, because obviously he didn't put a, a nice little bow on it, even though he probably thought he did. It, none of it made sense. So that that's where it kind of you're starting to see if the Jets are fine, no one's going to talk about this again or, or, or remember it. But if if they struggle early in the season and they're two and four, it's going to feel like they're two and ten and people are going to be acting like they're two and ten. And it's just another thing that they have to deal with. And they, they just have so many they have put so many targets on their back that it, it, that's going to be a factor is how they handle all that yet again after, you know, things. Clearly, they didn't handle it well last year. So I think that's where this matters. And it, it's just a sign that something's a little bit off. Now, they have enough talent on the roster where they may be able to overcome that, but also they haven't had a history of overcoming adversity and there's still a lot of question marks and, and that's just the off the field stuff. So um, a lot of question marks on the field too um, about, about some of their new additions and, you know, the same thing with the jets in terms of the most important thing going into training camp is the offensive line and, and them getting meaningful reps together. And, and that's, you know, going into those, first joint practices before the first preseason game with Washington, so that those guys have to be on the field, the offensive line for the joint practices. And, and, and that's kind of what I'm looking at for, for training camp. And obviously Rogers, that that's, what's really important, but, but this is just a nice little reminder that the jets are still, you know, until proven otherwise the jets and, and also for it to happen on the same day where, uh, you know, your, your big time edge rusher that, the Jets had been acting all offseason like they had the contract situation under control because they traded for him. Um, even up to a week before it, before he didn't show up for minicamp, Salah is saying out loud that he thinks that they, that he expects Reddick to be there. I mean, none of none of that. When you combine it all together, it's not the end to the offseason the Jets wanted. Ultimately, not a huge deal if they figure it out on the field, but. Uh, it's just a preview of of kind of the nonsense that they'll have to deal with. Much of it self generated, all almost all of it self generated if things go badly. So, yeah, I th I think overall still a good off season for the Jets, a really good off season, and um, that what matters is is being on the field for those reps during training camp. And I think both Reddick and Ro I mean obviously Rogers will be there barring injury. Um, you know, the Jets and Reddick both have too much at stake to not get something done. Um, 
And obviously Reddick's not being properly compensated right now. So, you know, I think it'll be like a one year band aid type deal because uh, he needs to play. He needs to play to, to prove it and get the contract he wants. So uh, a lot of incentive there for, for both sides. But yeah, that's that's kind of the two big things for the Jets heading into the offseason and um, her heading into this break here. And, and that's the big question. We'll, we'll now like I think the Rogers thing will fade away for the most part until the next ridiculous thing he says. <laughs> but but is Reddick going to be there week one uh, or day one of training camp? And and really, is he going to be there for the first padded practice? If he misses a day or two, it's not a big deal. It'll be a big deal. But I think the Jets will want to get it done before, and I think I think they will. Rogers just obviously, you know, once again looking like a hypocrite, given especially given yeah. the, about flushing, getting rid of the BS. Like my God, you got to be kidding me! Like really decides to like go on a, a trip. In, instead of being there, okay, like again, it's not, it won't impact the on pro, field product, but it will, it does impact optics, like it or not, fair or not. And like you said, it's going to make a slow start look like a catastrophic start because this is something that everyone is going to be dredging up. Um, and look, and people say, oh, you know, it's, you know, just the media is going to be dredging. No, I mean, <laughs> there's enough fans who are sick and tired of all this nonsense that the Jets have been going through for so long that, that they just want they want this team to win football games and they're tired of all the outside circus stuff. And so um, yeah. if look, if, if this is followed by the Jets winning, people are not going to remember it and they're going to be like, fine. I mean, they'll sign for all the nonsense. And, and that's what you know you're getting with Aaron Rodgers, a lot of nonsense if it means winning. I mean, that's they, they yet to, yet to obviously because of the torn Achilles, yet to reap the rewards of 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 the good stuff that Aaron Rodgers brings, which is successful play on the field. That's why he's like worth the BS, right? I mean, in the NFL, guys can get away with a lot. Of, I mean, not that he's done you know criminal things, obviously, but you could see you've seen guys given second chances in the NFL, uh, you know, after screwing up, right? Or, or not that necessarily he screwed up per se, but he's done things that like. If he was obviously not a great player or whatever, it wouldn't be worth it. But he can get away with these things because he gets the benefit of the doubt of being or at least perceived as a great player. Now, will he still be great coming off the Achilles? That's so fascinating to see. I think it'll be really, really obviously interesting to see. And the Reddick thing, certainly another one to, to to hover over. Obviously, Robert Sala, I don't know what it looks like inside the locker room or how he's perceived, but he like just looks completely limp. You know, he just looked, he got completely neutered by this Aaron Rodgers thing. I mean, come on, like he, he, he looked, this, he just came off looking so terrible in terms of, you know, who's running the show there. And, uh, you know, Salah's uh, delivery and handling of all this versus, you know, not excusing, just excuse the absence. My gosh. I mean, they could, they could screw up a one car funeral at times, you know, in this, this organization. And, and it's not just been him. It's been, it's, it, I think what happened to, with, with the issue with him is when he does do these dumb things, which is, this is the dumb, you know, it's, it's the accumulation works against him. Like all the years of all the dumb things, the Rex dumb things and, and the Gase dumb things and all that stuff. It's just Jets fans have so much scarring from all that, 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 that the next guy to come along to do something stupid, like Sal has done multiple times, uh, well, not winning, uh, which is the big, the big one, um, gets less of a benefit of the doubt. Every, you know, it's just like this buildup. So anyway, um, I, again, yeah, I mean, just just real quick, it does, none of it makes any sense if, if if he did tell them about the absence at the beginning of OTAs, like they claim. Why would they have season ticket holders already there for the first OTA practice and then announce it like? less than an hour before the practice it, when you could have gotten out in front of it and it's a non-story or, I mean, it wouldn't have been a non-story, but it wouldn't have been a big deal. It would have just been the part that we said, he was there for all those kids. This is going to be a big deal on the field. It's a little hypocritical and it's over, but, it, and we talk about Reddit, but instead it's this surprise thing. It's, it's ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. And I, you know, as much as Sala, you know, for Sala to like act like he's disciplining him, it's not an excused absence, but then in, literally, the same sentence or, or seconds or minutes later to say like, if it's important to Aaron, it's important to us. I mean, it's just insane. It doesn't even make it. It's, it's, it's laughable. So I, I will say, and I don't have any reporting or information on this, just from an observational standpoint, um, Woody Johnson is an unpredictable fellow. It has to be, you know, if some of these things don't make sense, let, like it could be coming from him. I, I or, or, Stemming from from that, it just makes too much sense. It's the only way that this would make sense. Um, 
and I'm not going to like get the specifics of, of speculating on that, but I just will say for, for a coach trying to keep that guy happy, yeah, you, know, you might have to say some nonsensical or do some nonsensical things. Um, and, and I, it's not a position for, I'd want to be in the, the most, like not, not dealing with the speculation from the media or, or dealing with the pressure or the expectations, but like dealing with trying to keep Woody happy when you know he's we've already seen reporting about him you know weighing in behind the seeds and bringing things to, to coach and gm's attention it, it's got to be a super difficult situation and and maybe that's to explain some of this stuff um because it's the only way it makes sense otherwise it's just complete madness and it is complete madness anyway and it, it it's kind of again that's why it's a big deal that's why it shows that the jets like still aren't past this you know dysfunction that's kind of you know, you know, they had some success in the playoffs early in, in Woody's ownership of the team, but really it's been the theme now for 15 years. Uh, the only consistent team surrounding this team is that uh, the, the, it's silly season every season. Good point. Yeah, I mean, and w- obviously Salah, you know, looks like a puppet here, and all these coaches are to a degree, you know, answering, obviously the answer to somebody. Uh, but look, if you're Salah, you know, the you kind of know what you're getting into with this organization and working for Woody Johnson and you, you're not going to turn the job down. It's one of 32. And now it's a chance. Hey, if Salah goes and wins a ring with the jets, it, no one's going to remember. Well, maybe not in the long term. you know, what a, what a puppet he was, or, you know, that it was Rogers who did it. Okay. You know, like he, he will be remembered as the guy who, and, and, and again, even if it's not a ring, who get, brings him some success. Okay. So yeah, yeah like he'll get some, certainly some credit for that as well he should so anyway i just it, it, it's a, it's he's, gotta, he's gonna have to swallow yeah. a bunch of crap you know basically yeah he's not and he's clearly like not real great at it because i think he's also kind of we've seen he's an emotional guy he's kind of tried to keep it under wraps as, head, as a head coach but we've seen several times where he can't and look I, uh, look i wouldn't want to be in a situation I, but i would want his paycheck so i can't feel too sorry for him yes and that comes with the job. He doesn't handle it well either. And I'm, I'm not excusing whatever strategy they thought that was just going to, if they thought that was just going to work and oh, okay, nothing to see here. Uh, you'd think they would have learned by now, but, but they're in just the weirdest situation. Cause I think if it goes badly this season, you could see the jets first mid season coaching change in a long time. Uh, I, I don't even know when the last one was, I should know that. I'm sorry, but I, I know that, yeah, it, it, it's not something that that Woody has done often, if at all. I don't even think it has happened under Woody. And then, um, but <laughs> you know, I, I think if they win a playoff game or get to the playoffs, there's a good chance both of these guys' jobs are safe, like for now. And if they win a couple games in the playoffs, I think it'll be treated. I mean, because this fan base is so desperate for any success, um, that that. It, they're in a weird situation where they could save their jobs for multiple years without really even getting to the AFC championship game. So um, I, I know some, a lot of Jets fans will want to hear that, but it's just a weird, weird dynamic, a weird high stakes season, very Jets. But I, I mean, it's going to be interesting and something, I mean, it's going to be interesting. It has to be interesting because the stakes are so high. So it, it's definitely going to be a fascinating season, but man, it's going to be, like if if it's looking like that in May and June, in early June, you can imagine what it's going to look like the first week of September, and it is going to be, it's going to make last year look like, you know, very tame compared to the the intensity, uh, that's going to be, you know, the scrutiny that's going to be following this team this year, and, and again, it's going to be interesting to see how they they handle that and how they handle success if they have it, and and how obviously it's going to be rough if if they don't have it. For sure. Uh, and to answer your question, Lou Holtz, 1976, the last there time the Jets made a midseason coaching change. They they actually did it the year prior as well, and those are the only two times. Um, kind of shifting here from looking back at the spring, and obviously we've been doing a lot of looking forward in, in, these, in, in this chat so far. Um, but in terms of the biggest questions the Giants need to answer um, – in, in in the in training camp, obviously with the quarterback situation, we know, right? Like how's Jones going to look, you know, where, where's the weapons? 
like production going to come from, especially with things being thin at tight end, thin at running back, you know, they're going to depend on Malik neighbors to carry this whole thing. I think the line is a super fascinating forward looking question for this, this giants team. Andrew Thomas should be good. If he comes back healthy, looks like he's fine now. So the interior John Michael Schmitz at center, he had a bad rookie year. Um, will there be upgrades with Runyon at rich on Runyon at right guard and a Jermaine Illuminor or left guard. And then, obviously the big question with Evan Neal, you know, what can the giants get from him? Will he be healthy? Will he be productive? Uh, you know, I just think the, the notion of moving into guard at this point, I mean, come on, forget that. Like the guy just needs to get back on the field and play tackle. And if, and if he can't put him on the bench, okay. And then let Illuminor play right tackle and then put somebody else at left guard. Okay. Whether that's, um, Josh Azudu, I don't know. I mean, gee whiz, right? But like, or um, Aaron Stinney would probably be, I don't I guess that's how I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Uh, so that those are the big questions. I think I alluded to it earlier. The position battles in the secondary are really going to be interesting to watch. I mean, there, there's kind of sort of some position battles, obviously, on offense, especially at tight end. Um, with Darren Waller gone, you got Dan, Daniel Bellinger and then the rookie Theo Johnson. The secondary is a really interesting group, I think, for this Giants team right now because uh yeah they're not going to have to play as much man as they did under wink martindale uh but uh, a lot of like, really green secondary no adoree jackson who was a veteran did not play well last year no xavier mckinney obviously a veteran did play well last year played great got got paid by the packers since joe shane clearly doesn't want to pay safeties or running backs and does want to would rather invest you know at, at edge rusher so tyler newbin the second rounder <laughs> You thought, you know, he'd be the free safety, right, in the spring? Not necessarily. And they put Dane Belton there, who was not really necessarily impressed through a couple of years. So that that's a fascinating one to watch, Belton versus Newbin at free safety. Um, in terms of the other outside corner spot, the Giants didn't make a high-profile uh, addition opposite Deontay Banks, who needs to be better, obviously, in year two, but he's got some potential. They take Cordell Flott, slide him out of the slot, put him on the outside. He's got versatility, but is he ready to be the, the number two outside corner there? Um or is he better suited in the slot? And then in the slot, they've been putting Nick McLeod, who's a versatile, a former undrafted guy, um, has played all over the secondary instead of Drew Phillips, a third round rookie who could also play in the slot. But again, it's green, very green, unproven secondary across the board, um, and that that could be something that certainly to watch. It will be something to watch. So is it, is it going to be McLeod, Nick McLeod, or Drew Phillips in the slot? Is it going to be Tyler Newbin or Dane Belton at free safety? And then they seem very much committed to having Cordell Flott at the other outside corner spot. Not that they have a ton of options. I mean, this is a, a, a giant team. When you look across, there's some positions that give you a lot of pause about, you know, what you can get from them. I think everyone feels good about the front with Dexter Lawrence, Brian Burns, Kayvon Thibodeau, of course, big strength there. But beyond that, I mean, geez. Uh, so that that's sort of where the Giants stand in terms of their biggest questions going into training camp and things they kind of, they do want to get sorted out, right, in terms of position battles, in terms of who will rise at those positions where – and then sorting out not certain not the, the right tackles of position battle, but who's going to be is Neil going to be ha- healthy? And if he's not, what do they do? Um, so the what ifs and the position battles those are the ones we'll be watching come late July. Uh, and Andy, we we can kind of just pivot to the Jets and and wind it down from here. Where are the Jets' most intriguing questions going into training camp? Obviously, you mentioned sort of the non football stuff with Rogers and then the contractual stuff with Reddick, but. Uh, in terms of their other questions, what do they have to get sorted out in training camp? Yeah, the offensive line is is always going to be the key for the Jets in training camp, especially when there's this many changes. You're talking about the three new starters um, and, and another starter moving positions in Elijah Vera Tucker, who's going to be at right guard now, uh, which is where I guess he started the season last year, but but over the last two years has played every position but center on the line. So. Um, I don't think you can really say, you know, it's fair to say he's a returning starter in his position. So, um, yeah, to me, I'm watching like, Morgan Moses is supposed to be ready at the start of camp. I think that's the the kind of the domino to watch. Uh, we'll, we'll just leave Tyron, Tyron Smith alone at this point. He, he's looked really good, played 13 games last year. I mean, that's obviously a huge concern as well, given his the fact that he – you know, missed more games than he played in the in the three years before that by a wide margin. But you know, he all indications are he'll be ready for the start of camp. With Morgan Moses, they say he's gonna be ready. We saw him running around but not doing anything at mini camp last week. 
I say this because if Morgan Moses isn't ready at the start of camp, you tie in the new guy, Fashanu. Uh, I think he has a chance to start at right tackle at the beginning of camp and, and, and keep that job for the rest of the season. If, if, you know, the number 11th pick in the draft looked, looks good. And that could be kind of, you know, the first, you know, surprise or, one of the few position battles the Jets have. I mean, I mean beyond that, it's it's just interesting. And and going back to how important Reddick is, if, if you look at the the depth chart at edge rusher, where the the Jets had two solid waves last year, now behind Reddick and and Jermaine Johnson, who had a breakout year last year, you have Will McDonald and and really Michael Clemens, and, and it's just for a team that that relies on rotation, it's going to be a little bit different, even if they have everybody at full strength. So I, I think that's something to watch. I think that the defensive line has a chance to be, you know, better than it's ever been and, and really good. And, and maybe, uh, you know, one of the best in the NFL, if, if everything goes right. But if they lose one of, one of those guys, you know, Jermaine Johnson or, or Reddick, it, it's a, it's a problem because now you're, you're starting somebody we've never heard of or, or having somebody we've never heard of play a, a huge amount of, of reps and even having Michael Clemens out there for a long time, you know, there's nothing in his first couple of years uh, that makes you think that's going to be an upgrade for them. So uh, yeah, it's just something to watch. And then, you know, safety is a positional battle, not, not the sexiest one. I think, I think Chuck Clark is, is pretty much, you know, the favorite to win that job alongside Tody Adams. Maybe if he's not a hundred percent, everything, every indication is he is a hundred percent a year after tearing his ACL uh Ashton Davis could give him a run for the job but I think it's going to be Clark and Adams back there and then running back is the other position where it gets interesting um obviously Brees Hall is gonna have the majority of the carries but it, it seems wide open behind him with with the two rookies Isaiah Davis and, and Braylon Allen who was really Allen was really impressive in camp the youngest player in the NFL by by a wide margin he's gonna turn 21 in January um, if he gets on the field at all this season, he'll be the youngest Jet ever to play. Looks really solid, especially catching the ball. It's kind of the only way as a running back this time of year you can stand out, and and he sure did. Uh, he, I, I mean, again, it's it's shorts and that kind of stuff, but there there was a deep ball where from Tyrod Taylor where he looked like a a big wide receiver going up. He, I think he's six six two, you know, two forty. So so he's a he's a big dude and. Um, We'll see what it looks like with contact, but yeah, he 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 seems like he could be play a role in the in the passing game, uh, and yeah, basically it's kind of on Izzy Abanaconda here, the, the fourth round pick last year, who saw a guy get picked in the fourth round and fifth round ahead of him this year at his position. I think he's got you know a, a battle on his hands to to earn a roster spot, so that's going to be interesting. Um, but that's really it. I mean, most of the of the positions are set for the Jets. Uh, the offensive line, to me, and, and making sure Rodgers is is continuing to, you know, be as close to 100 percent as he can. But but really, the offensive line um, is the the big thing I'm going to be watching during camp to see how that all sorts out. And most importantly, for the Jets, we we've learned over the last several years that shuffling around during training camp, your offensive line is not a recipe for success. Um, they need to have a camp where they basically have at least four guys out there most of the time. And, and really I'd say all five of them, you know, for those joint practices. So that that's going to be they, because they can't, you know, with three games and 10 days to start the season, the, they need, they need those reps. They need, they need that time together and it can't be something they throw together. Like they had, have tried the last two weeks with Dwayne Brown giants week of, of camp. So um, that doesn't work as we saw in the fourth snap of the season last year. So, um, yeah, that, that to me is, is what to watch for in training camp. Obviously it all starts with Rogers and getting him through healthy, but beyond that, um, that offensive line, it could be much better, but, uh, if they're not in the field together, it's not going to matter. Yeah. That, I mean, that pretty much sums it up. The one thing I did not mention, obviously, you know, the giants have Devin Singletary, you brought, you talked about the, the, uh, the Jets running back depth and help yeah, me obviously are going to lean heavily on Brees Hall. I'll be fascinated to see how heavily the Giants lean on Devin Singletary versus mixing in Eric Gray or Tyrone Tracy, neither of whom is obviously proven Tracy being the rookie um, there. So could they do a committee thing? Do they lean heavily on Singletary? Obviously 
Uh, Singletary is not going to be able to replace Saquon Barkley's production alone. And perhaps, you know, even the, even Singletary slash Gray or Singletary slash Tracy or all three, you know, will we'll struggle to do that. So that's certainly something to, to watch as well. So we'll wrap it up with that. Appreciate everyone listening. Thank you for taking the time to do that. And f- thanks for taking the time to read our stuff as always. NJ.com slash Jets, NJ.com slash Giants. And we'll have plenty of stuff here leading up to training camp. Both going to take a little bit of time off, but uh, there'll be plenty of coverage and posts up there uh, throughout uh, these five weeks. And so obviously uh, you can always like, rate, review, subscribe to us on all your favorite podcasting platforms. We really appreciate that. Thanks for the support. Thanks for listening. And we will talk to you all in a little more than a month uh, as we get closer to or perhaps during the first week of uh, NFL training camps. So everyone take care. Thanks. Stay cool out there.